Come on, some more love for Pastor Mike. How many world changers in the house? Oh yeah, that's what we exist to do. Uh, I want to just uh, mention that uh, a couple of things before I start. Um, first of all, welcome to our visitors. My name is Pastor Moravi, just in case you're wondering. Uh, and I am the senior pastor of Avuno Church. I'm so excited to be here this morning. I want to just mention in a, in a week's time, uh, we'll be starting Fearless 2012. And it's going to be an incredible opportunity uh, for us to change the world together. We have people coming from all over the world uh, to be part of this. And it's going to be on Wednesday, uh, the, the, the 4th of July to Friday, the 6th of July. It's going to be the whole day. Some of you have asked, can I come for some of the sessions? Uh, I think that's, that's definitely possible. Uh, so you can talk to the people at the Fearless Tent after this and I'll be able to connect with them. And also something that's happening this coming Friday, it's Worship Night. I know some, by the way, I know Worship Night has just become such a, a highlight for many of us. It's a time when we just come and we, we spend time before God and we connect with Him. If you've never been, how many people have been to a Worship Night? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I can, you, can tell, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, if you've never been to a worship night, make this your first one. We're going to be talk, praying and we're going to be especially just uh, focusing on some of the prayers out of this series because I know that God wants us to be the world changers uh, that he's called us to be. So Friday, this coming Friday, starts at 6, goes all the way to 10 and it's just a time to come and let loose. Uh, if you come from the office, it's okay, you can come in your suit. Uh, but if you can go through home and pass, get some sneakers first. Because we hung, we, we really do. I mean, we, we, we just let loose. It's, it's a really nice time. And so come if you've not been. It's going to be a great, great time. Well, one of my favorite films is Mission Impossible. Dun, 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 can see a few of you uh, have watched Mission Impossible. And the, the, the premise of this series, it, 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 it features uh, Tom Cruise, of course, is the main actor in it. He, he acts as the agent Ethan Hunt, who heads a team of agents from a covert CIA uh, operative, shadow operative group that is called, M, they're actually called IMF, which doesn't stand for International Monetary Fund. Apparently, it's only Africans who know what that is. Uh, it stands for the Impossible Mission Force. And basically the premise of this thing is that this group of agents, they're the ones you call when there's an impossible thing to be done. When there's a project that has to be done that cannot be done. Because they're not the difficult mission force. They're the impossible mission force. I have news for you as we start today. Our God is the God of the impossible. Our God is the God of the impossible and there are impossible things that he wants to do in our lives through us. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today. I want to begin by just praying some impossible prayers in this house. There are some of you who are going through an impossible situation. And it's a situation you've been praying about. You've hit, you've hit a wall. And there are some of you who've hit such a hard wall that you've wanted to give up. Some of you, even on your own life. And before I begin my sermon, I just sense God would want me to pray an impossible prayer for you. If this is you I'm, I'm praying about, just stand up right now. I sense there are some of you who've been through such a tough time. Such a difficult time. And you've almost given up. Maybe even coming to church was, you know what, I just need hope in my situation. Come on, stand up right now. You know I'm talking about you. Because the Lord is saying to you, this is a word I have from, from the Lord to you. You know what, I am the God of the impossible. This is what our God is saying. So come on, just let's appreciate these who are standing up. There are of, so many of us who are going through impossible situations. And our God is saying this. That I want to show you, even before I use you to do impossible things, I want to do impossible things in your life. That you will know. Because hey, you're not looking at me like you know right now. But you will know that our God is a God of the impossible. Oh, come on, just stretch out your hands, those of you who are sitting towards them. Begin to pray a prayer right now. We're going to pray for breakthrough. We're trusting God for breakthrough in this house right now. And for those of you who are being prayed for, lift up your hands right now and surrender to the Lord. Our God is here. He makes all things new. He makes all things new. Your commitment to Him is to say, Lord, I will follow you. But he makes all things new. And as you follow him forward, he's able to break through. Lord, we want to pray some impossible prayers in the house right now. Lord, I sense that the faith is in this house for us to see impossible things happen. Lord, I sense that some people right now who are in such a difficult situation, they do not know the beginning from the end. They do not know where to turn left or right. They're just in a place where they're stuck right now. And Lord, as we come to you right now, we want to begin, as we speak about impossible things, we want to believe that you, the God of the impossible, is in this house. And that Lord, you're able to speak in every one of these situations represented here. 
Lord Jesus, I want to come against any spirit of impossibility in the lives of those who are represented here. We bind it in the name of Jesus. And we speak right now, Lord, breakthrough in the situations they're in. There are some of them who are praying for somebody who is sick. And they've not been able to find anything happening as a result of their prayer. Right now, we are joining our faith to theirs. And we are speaking healing in that situation. There are some of them who are unemployed, who have been praying and trusting for financial provision. And nothing has been coming through. Right now, Lord, you who is the God of the impossible, do something in their lives. Lord, make a sign that will prove to them that our God reigns. Our God is able. Our God is the provider. There are some of them who are going through an impossible relationship situation. Something in their marriage. Something in their relationship. I'm praying that this week, Lord, you would give them a sign of hope. You would show them that our God reigns. Our God is on the throne. He's able to do it. And Lord, I want to pray for that person. Because I, you, you showed me that there's this person who's going to come to our services. In fact, not one, but several. Who've been at that place where they've almost given up on their own lives. Who've been at that place where they've even considered committing suicide. And Lord, right now, I want to speak the word you gave me for them. You will not die, but you will live. And you will glorify God to your generation. The Lord has a, a breakthrough for you. The Lord has light for you. Listen, do not give up. Don't listen to the devil. Don't give up. Because the Lord has plans for you. Great plans to prosper you and not to harm you. To give you hope and a future. And so I speak over you right now, hope. I speak the, the, the glorious miracle of hope in your life. Hope that is beyond you. It's not you psyching for this hope. God right now is depositing hope in your spirit. And this thought of suicide is cast out of your mind in the name of Jesus. You will live and you will not die. And Father God, right now, in every one of these situations, I speak forth a miracle. I speak forth, Lord, a testimony. That Lord Jesus, as a result of this prayer, Lord, if I'm not your servant, if I'm your servant, Lord, as a result of this prayer, that some breakthrough will happen, even this week, a sign that you're with your people. You are the God of the impossible, and we're trusting you right now to do it. For we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, God's people said. Come on, let's appreciate the Lord by faith. He is going to do it. He's going to do it. Our God is the God of the impossible. For our visitors, we've been going through a series this month. It's called Heroes Wanted, an invitation to change the world. This is what we are talking about at Mavuno this month. In the book of Acts, we've been tracking a very ordinary group of people. Very ordinary, very kawaida looking people. But these people had a defining encounter with God's power. And they were never the same. In fact, they changed their city, they changed their region, and after that they went on and changed their world. God is still in the business, this is what we've been saying, of calling out superheroes. God is still looking for heroes. He's in the business of raising heroes who will change the world. And this is what we've been talking about this whole month. Now today we want to conclude this series, Heroes Wanted. Because next week we're going to do something special. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. You just have to come and find out. But I want to conclude this series. And the title of my message is Mission Possible. Dun, 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 dun. Dun. Your neighbor doesn't watch movies, so just sing for them. Dun, 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 dun. I love Mission Impossible. Sorry. Acts chapter 11, uh, verse 1 to 18. God is in, the, is in the business of raising superheroes. Mission possible. Acts 11, 1 to 18. Acts 11, 1 to 18. This is what it has to say. This is what the Bible tells us today. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. And they said, you went into the house of, an uncircumcised, of uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Peter began to explain everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked, I looked into it, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. 
And I had a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, you need to understand for a, 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 an Orthodox Jew like Peter, this was a horrible thing. Because the Jews had traditional foods they were not supposed to eat. Jews have very, very strict dietary laws. Even today, there's some things they just don't mix. There's some things that you just don't touch. And the things that were on the sheet were the things that Peter understood he was not supposed to eat. But the voice tells him, get up, kill and eat. And I replied, Peter says, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I, uh, where I was staying. And the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me. And we entered the, the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house. And, had said, and the angel had said to him, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and they praised God saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Father, we just pray as we come to your word this morning. We thank you because we're here. Your word is our daily bread. It's what we feed on. It's the way you direct us. We pray that, Lord, as we come to your word, that no power of hell, no confusion, no veil over our eyes, nothing will keep us from hearing your word today. You have a word for your people, Lord. And Lord, I thank you because every one of us is loved by you. None of us, none of us is a side thought for you. Every one of us is a center of your attention. And so I pray that, Lord, anything that would keep us from hearing your word would be bound and gagged and banished from this place. And that, Lord, your power and presence will be here to speak to your people. Lord, I bless you and I thank you. Lord, I decree now that the truth shall set your people free. For I pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. You might notice that I pray that prayer every time I speak. And the reason is because one day I was praying and the Lord showed me that sometimes when I preach, there are veils that are over people's eyes. It was a picture that I saw and I saw like, it was like I was looking at a congregation. I just saw white eyes looking back at me. And the Lord said, every time you preach, speak. Because there are forces that will keep my people from hearing what I have to say. So that just explains why I pray for you in the way I do. Now you know. Now you know. Because you know the devil doesn't want you to understand who you are. Do you know that? He doesn't. If I was a devil, the one thing I would do is I would make it my preoccupation to keep you from understanding the power you have to terrorize me. So I'd keep you praying prayers like, Oh God, this devil is harassing me! Not understanding the Bible, I said what? Resist the devil? And he will flee from you! So I would deceive you. And I would make you not understand the eternal power, the awesome power that you have at your fingertips. The same power that God used to raise Christ from the dead. I'm preaching before I start preaching. So let me start preaching now. <laughs> Peter was in trouble. The great apostle Peter was in trouble. Even though he was one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, he was facing serious criticism from the leaders and fellow believers, church members of that church. You see, he had broken some ancient taboos. There were things he had done that were not supposed to be done. You see, Jews were not supposed to associate with foreigners because Jews considered themselves a chosen people. They were not supposed to associate with people who were different from them, let alone share a meal with them in their houses. But that's exactly what the apostle Peter had done. And as a result, people were unhappy with him. They were dragging his name in the mud. They kept whispering and whispering, do you know what Peter is doing? And finally, when he showed up in Jerusalem, they were waiting for him. They wanted him to explain, what is this that he was doing? They had two major objections to what Peter was doing. The first was religious. And this one is more common, more obvious as you read the text. They had a religious uh, re objection to what he was doing. The Jews believed they were the, they were the chosen people. Contact with non-Jews 
would lead to contamination of them and their faith. What if they went and talked to those people and something happened to them? What if they ended up thinking like them, becoming like them? And so as a result, the Jews kept themselves separate. Even though Jesus had told his disciples, go into the world, represent me in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You know, they agreed with the first part, but that last part, that's somebody else's job. They didn't really think that they wanted to get contaminated by associating with people who had issues and people who were outside their faith. You know, this thinking didn't end in the Bible. Many Christians today still have that thinking. Many Christians are afraid of being contaminated by sinners. They're afraid of being contaminated by people with issues. Lest their issues spread on them. Look at your neighbor. Do they look like they have issues? Shivas, you look at them. Because <laughs> their issues could jump on you. Many people are afraid. Many Christians are afraid. But you know, seven years ago when we started Mavuno Church, we began it with a resolution that we would reach people who are not being reached by the church. We were determined not to start a church that would recycle the saints. That's a pretty common practice. That people start the latest, hottest church. And people from other churches come to check it out and they stay. And any new church starts and, other, and all the Christians flock there. We didn't want to recycle saints. We didn't want to receive people from other churches. Because you see, we had friends. I had friends. Many of my friends did not go to church. Many of my friends were suspicious of the church. In fact, they were hostile towards the church. They thought church was just a place that they got hustled or they got religious drivel that didn't make sense. Some of them only went to church when they were in problems. You see, I was one of the few in my rugby team who ended up being a pastor. In fact, the only one as far as I knew at the time. And so the time I got, they would talk to me as my friends would talk to me and they say, you know, there's this chick I made pregnant and now she wants the baby to be baptized. See, so you're my pastor. See, so you're a pastor. You can hook us up. Just come to the house. Just At least I have a buddy who's one of them who can do those things that she wants done. But you know, just stay away from that place because it's not a place that is helpful for people like myself. I had friends like those. Many of them had not been to church for years. And so we began Mavuno Church with an intention to reach such people. And to our amazement, they began to come. People who had no business being in church. People who, look, who didn't even know their way around a church. They didn't know what an asha was. They didn't know what off, they, they had no idea what was going on. They just were completely lost in the church. But they began to come because they were finding life. They were finding solutions. You see, we became a church that was reaching people who were not accepted by the church. The church were addicts and players. You know, players. Bad boys. Baby mamas. Divorcees. People who did not feel accepted by the church. They were coming and were receiving help. And I even want to say this this morning. You know how your neighbor looks so saved and so nice? Many of these people were exactly like that when they walked into this church. In fact, as I'm looking around, I'm recognizing them. So stop being intimidated by your neighbor. They, have, they had as many issues as you do. In fact, they still have. They're, God is just sorting them out slowly. Amen? So, 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 so never be intimidated by anybody who looks very holy at Mavuno Church. Because you, you don't know where they came from. You have no idea where they came from. This is who we became as a church. But you know, in the process, we faced a lot of criticism. There are many people who did not understand what we were doing. There are many other Christians who did not understand what we were doing. We, we had people saying, we're just trying to be a cool church. We're, we're contaminating the gospel. We're, we're corrupting the word of God. We had people say that th this, this is just a, it's just a, a six-month church. Just go in, get a fix, and then go back to a real church where you can get deep in God's word. We had all those criticisms. I knew the criticism. People would tell me all the time, guess what so-and-so say? Guess what such-and-such -such said? But you know, I was ready for it because I've come to learn. If you ever want to do something great in your generation, expect opposition. Trust me, you will never be great if you're trying to be popular. If you want to do something that is great, expect opposition. So we were ready for it. We were ready for it as we began. Now I know for Mavuno, there will always be criticism. In fact, I pray for Mavuno that there will always be criticism. You know why? Because the minute you start becoming very accepted and be begin to become very respectable, then you forget what you are called to do.
we're going to find pressure from people telling us, you know guys, you've been going for it long enough now. Now, now we're getting, look at the people around Mavuno. They're, they're respectable people. Are you seeing the person next to you? They look respectable, don't they? They look very respectable. They look like they have a respectable family. So come on, Mavuno, tone it down. Let's get respectable. That's the pressure that's going to come. And by the way, some of that pressure even comes from people who came into church because we were not respectable. Because we were on the edge. But that pressure comes. Stop being on the edge. You know what I pray for you, Mavuno? That you will never stop being on the edge. That's what I pray for. This the, the city needs churches that are on the edge. Because people have to be reached. People have to be reached. This gospel is not for us. Do you understand the minute you became a believer? Pam! You could have gone to heaven like this. Your mansion was there already. You're not on earth to earn salvation. Once you have it, you have it. Why are you on earth? Oh, you don't know. So I tell you. <laughs> the main reason God has left you on earth is to represent Him and to make sure your peers who don't know Him also get to know Him. God will never preach the gospel to somebody else. That's your job. And this is the only reason the church is here. It's not for us to get comfortable and to get fed. It's to reach out to others. This was the pressure Peter went, uh, went, was, was faced with. We too will be faced with this pressure. You just need to know it and we must make a resolution. I pray for you, Mavuno, that you will never be, stop being hungry to see your office being reached, to see your peers who'd never come to church come into church. This is why we exist. However, I want to talk more about the second objection to what Peter had done because I, I, I think this first one, I think we get it. Many of us get it. We know why we're here. But there's a second objection to what Peter had done. And this one had to do with the scope of responsibility. It had to do with responsibility. The Jews, you see, were a very poor, insignificant people. They were one of the smaller countries that had been colonized, one of the smaller people that had been colonized by the Romans, who had colonized huge nations like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, more sophisticated peoples. And I suspect as they looked at this mission to reach the ends of the earth, they must have asked themselves, why is that our business? Why is it our problem? It's not the first time they ask this. If you read through the Bible, you find the prophet Jonah asked the same thing. He was asked to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was a superpower at the time. And he, why, why is that my problem? Israel has enough issues of its own. Why is it me who has to go and help those rich people get their act together? You know, I believe the same thinking dogs us today as a church in Africa. According to popular wisdom, there are some things that are not supposed to happen there's some things that are just not supposed to happen when you hear the word missionary what's the first thing that comes to your mind a white person older <laughs> financial resource that has sent them from another place isn't it is that what you think you think of somebody from another country another another race who has come to look after the poor people in our context you never think you know, I remember once I had this shock experience because one airline was advertising a missionary rate uh, to fly, a discount. So I thought, okay, I'm a missionary. Uh, and I went and I applied and the lady was processing and uh, so I said, I'm a missionary. She looked at me like, you. And I could just tell in her face, wrong color, wrong accent. I mean, if you're right, you this color, but your accent sounded different, maybe you're a missionary, but you can't be. A, some things are not supposed to happen. When you think of the word donor, who do you think of? Big organization, isn't it? From the West that comes to help poor Africans to sort out their problems. You never think of someone like the person sitting next to you. Or oh, some of the people look, sitting next to you look really respectable. I know, I know, I know. But usually when you think donor, you think something big from the outside. You never think somebody who looks just like you. I remember when, uh, you remember when, when there was an, a big tsunami in Indonesia and a small group of Maasai herdsmen put together some cows to send to as relief. You remember the jokes that went out around those guys? It's like, who, who, what? what are they thinking? Then I remember a little while later we had the Japanese earthquake. And President Kibaki signed something to, to give some money as relief to Japan. Do you remember the kind of criticism that went out? Who does he think he... Doesn't he know we have issues? We have slums. Who are we to think that we can send money to rich countries like Japan? 
Some things are just not supposed to happen. There's an established order of things. And when we hear about donors, we don't think people like us. People who start non-profit organizations to help poor people. Who do you think of? People from the West, isn't it? Some things are just not supposed to happen. It's somebody else's job. But the amazing moral of this story that we just read is that God is no respecter of persons. Oh, somebody didn't hear me this morning. <laughs> That's what Peter is discovered in this vision. He says in Acts chapter 10 verse 34, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts men from every nation who fear him and who do what is right. God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't. He can use you to be a donor. Next time you think donor, don't think out there. Think Pastor M. At least think me. If you can't think yourself. Because I'm a donor. I bless people. Every month I bless people. I take poor children to school. I'm a donor as well. So, so stop thinking the way you've been taught to think. God is not a respecter of persons. He can use someone just like you in your situation to do impossible things. This is what this passage is teaching us. By sharing the gospel with a wealthy Roman Peter had no idea that he was opening the key that would lead to this explosion happening that would change Europe, change Asia, change North America, and eventually change us as well. This is how God uses very insignificant looking people to do incredibly difficult things. God is no respecter of persons. One of my friends from the US, he, he visited Mavuno. And I mean, we became friends on his visit. He loved what was going on here. He, he loved the way we were trying to change Africa. He was so excited about this. I mean, he was like, my goodness, I've never heard Africans talking like this. This is fantastic. And when I had a chance to visit him in the US, uh, we, we chatted and he was so, he was still excited. I could tell he was still excited about our church. And he said, I need to introduce you to some of my friends because people have to hear about the exciting things God is doing in Africa, that he's raising up Africans who can change Africa. And he told me as we were riding in the car where my wife was in, she can testify that, to this story. He asked me in the car, so what, just tell me the vision as, as we're planning this visit with his friends. He said, just tell me the vision of Mavuno again. And I told him, you know, our, our vision is to plant a culture defining church in every capital city of Africa and in the gateway city of the world by 2035. And he, 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 he sort of paused a bit and he said, okay, hold on a minute. As you talk to my friends, please leave out the gateway cities of the world part. Just leave it out. So I, I, I was a bit confused. I said, oh, so, so, so why, why would you want me to say our full vision? He said, you know, this thing about Africans changing Africa, it's already amazing enough. He says, I, 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 I really like you. And I want my friends to think you're a credible person. So if you start talking about the world, you might lose credibility. And I'm doing this because I mean, he, he basically I could tell he wasn't being condescending. He actually really seriously wanted his friends to accept me. And he was saying, you know what? There are some things that are... <clears throat> he didn't say this, but this is what he was... There are some things that are just not supposed to happen. Africans changing Africa? Whoa, that's big. Africans changing the world? Hey, okay, so now we are passing some boundaries that we're not supposed to be crossed. Some things are just not supposed to happen. But my God is the God of the impossible. And yes, it's true. I went and talked to his friends. I didn't mention about the vision to change their country as well and to change their children and their children's children because that's what I'm going to do in the name of Jesus. I respected my friend, but I knew, what I, I knew who I was. And I knew the power of God. Because you see, God is not a respecter of persons. It's not about who you are. It's who you represent. And you know what? I represent the most high God. I do. Wherever I go. And so I will change America. And I have what it takes to change it. I will change Japan. I have what it takes to change it. I'm not restricted to what Africans are supposed to do. Ask your neighbor, who do you represent? Because that's the most important question. In this passage, who do you represent? Who are you speaking for? This is a pertinent question. You know, God is turning things upside down, just like in the book of Acts. I don't know if you know this, so, I, so I'll tell you because I don't think you know it. In the last couple of centuries, some amazing things have happened. In 1900, 80% of the world's Christians lived in North America and Europe. 80%. It was rightfully called 
a Western religion, which was a bit ironic when you think about it, because Jesus was not, I often say during the Gulf War, Jesus looked more like Osama bin Laden than George Bush. Never thought about that one, did you? He, 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 he looked more Arab, Arab than he did Caucasian. This is who Jesus was. But somehow, because of the ability, the successful ability of the church to contextualize itself in the Western culture, a large impact was had in that culture. 80% of Christians came from those countries that were then almost referred to as Christian countries. But you know what has happened in the last couple of <laughs> centuries? There's been such a huge shift. And by 2005, the proportion was almost the other way around. That 60 plus percent of Christians lived outside Europe and North America in places like this. The typical Christian in the world today looks more like you than the missionary picture you have in your mind. You need to understand this. God is doing some amazing things in this time that we live in. They're over, <laughs> it's amazing that in 1990, I believe there were about 18 million uh, Christians. So, sorry, sorry, 1900. Today, there are over three... I'm even getting my facts wrong here. I think it was, it was like 1.8 million Christians. I'm sorry. Today, there are over 350 million Christians in Africa today. Do you understand what is happening? There's a shift in the center of Christianity. There's a shift in what God is doing. God is at work in this part of the world. And in many of those parts of the world where we formally call them Christian countries, today when you go there, you will find an amazing thing. You will find that in those amazing cathedrals, I've had the chance of, 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 of visiting some places in Europe where there are amazing buildings, where you look at them and you can only imagine the thousands of voices that must have been raised to worship God. People who gave of their lives to build these cathedrals over centuries. And now you're going to find a group of 20 very old people at the front having their service. And the ironic thing, in almost every church I went to, there's a whole, there's a, a, a rope at the back and Japanese tourists taking pictures. They've become an oddity. Many of these churches have now been closed, have been turned into markets and nightclubs and other things. Many of you who've traveled to Europe, you know what I'm talking about. This is a situation that is going on around it. So you have to ask yourself, how is that any of our business? Why is that our problem? And we have so many issues of our own here. Allow me to give you some perspective about that. You know, many years ago, decades ago, <laughs> when colonization was happening in Africa, there's an unknown story that is often mixed up with the story of colonization. And it's a very separate story. As the colonizers were coming to rip off this continent, to take what they could, there's a group of believers who came along, who did not agree with their government's policies. But who walked along? There are many stories of such people. Many times they even opposed what their governments were doing. But they left their homes and they came here and they believed that the people that they were finding here, even though they looked different from themselves, were loved by God. And they started schools and they began institutions to help the population in ways very different from what the colonial governments, the agenda of the colonial governments. Many of them were, were at odds with those governments. When you read the history, you're going to find that many, young many of them were young people. Many of these young missionaries were young people. Some of them just out of college or out of high school. And when they left home, the only conviction they had, because they were not going to be rich, they were giving up everything. They would get on that ship and they would be saying goodbye to their families, knowing they would never see them again. In fact, what the books tell us is many of them carried their belongings in their coffins. Because they knew, this is probably the last time I'll see my family. I'll be buried where I'm going. Many of them never involved themselves in any industry or anything. When they came here, they began the work of preaching and they went around and started churches. And as a result of their hard work, very hidden by the way, you, you, know, you, you know, whenever we think of our past history, we mix up the story with the colonialists. And we forget that there were some people driven by a completely different agenda. And because of those young people, many of them by the way, this was called the white man's graveyard because of malaria. And many of them got it as soon as they got here and they died before they did much. But because of their sacrifice, you and I are sitting here in Mavuno Church today believing we can find purpose in Christ Jesus. This because they cared. Here's what I'm trying to say in this sermon. It's our turn. Because you know there are some things Africans are not supposed to do. But I'm telling you from God's word, it's your turn. It's your turn. It's your turn to go out into the world and to share this gospel. 
hey, listen, they're dying out there. There are young people out there who are dying, who have no purpose, who are just living for themselves. You know, we may not have money like they do, but we have the power of the living God. And we have purpose in Him. And it's our turn. And God is looking at us and saying, it's your turn to go out into the world and to make disciples, to share about me. You see, it's not about where you come from. It's about who you represent. Ask your neighbor, who do you represent? You know, when we began our, when we wrote our vision as Mavuno and we began our strategic plan, our plan, like I shared last week, was very well thought out. At Mavuno, one thing we do well is we think. And we thought it. And we, 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 had, we, had, we had all the way till 2015, we're going to be in Nairobi only. Because we're like, that's what we have resources for. We're not going anywhere else. All the way from 2015 to 2025, that one we're going to try and reach Africa. That was our plan. And then from 2025 onwards, we're going to try and see if we can go out to the rest of the world. That was our plan. And I told you last week what God did with that plan. He just mixed it up. He said, listen, don't depend on the powers of man. Don't depend on your wisdom and your resources. Trust in me instead. So that's how Kampala began. I told you the story of that. But you know, as Kampala was starting, God was doing something even more incredible. A young couple from Germany, Eastern Germany, grew up in an atheistic uh, part of the country, uh, came to know Christ, got passionate about what he was doing, went into the church and found the churches dead. And they were frustrated, went into Bible school, and they just couldn't find any traction. And then they heard about what God was doing in this part of the world. And they were invited to come to this country. And they came and they connected with Mavuno Church. And they said, we want to be here. And we challenged them to stay with us for three years. They did their internship program here with us. They trained us pastors, just like we train our other pastors here. At three years, after three, by the way, we paid their salaries while they were here. We did. <laughs> you know what? We said, listen, don't even bother. We, we know you can probably talk to people out there, but we want to have the joy of having supported you. See, we are donors. Yes, we are. It's time for us to change our mindset. We're not always asking. We're giving as well. And we wanted to make a statement with that. And so we did. And then at the end of three years, we sent them to Berlin. By the way, we had no idea how they are going to start in Berlin because we had no money. Berlin is one of the most expensive places in Europe. But we also knew it's a cultural center. It's a gateway city. And we sensed that God was saying, send them to the hardest place. Very, very small proportion of people who go to church in Berlin. And we send them there. But you know what happened? God, our God is an amazing God. Our God is a God of the impossible. Because they got to Berlin, a, a church that had a building, had been a great church once, was now dying, had 60 members left. They knew they were dying. They knew they needed help. They heard about this couple. And they say to Daniel and Nancy Fleshing, because that's their name, they said, come and be part of us. Be our pastors and lead us. Daniel and Nancy said, not, hold on, not so fast. The only way we'll come and be your pastors is if you accept Mavuno's vision. In fact, the metaphor they use to them is, is if you give the remote control of this church to Mavuno Church in Nairobi, then we can be your pastors. Germans were in shock. What do you mean? And they explained everything. We had no idea that they would actually accept this because this part of town they're in is a very educated part of Berlin. Uh, these guys actually have rocket scientists in their congregation. You know, in Kenya, when you say you have to be a rocket scientist to... <laughs> they actually have real rocket scientists <laughs> who come to that. I mean, they've got architects. They've got, they're a very professional group. We had no idea that they would actually accept what they were being told. To our amazement, last year, some of you were here when this happened. They sent nine members of their church to come and hand over the remote control of their church to, to Mavuno Church. And they said, come and take over. Send your pastors there. We will accept the Mavuno Marathon. We will do Mizizi. We'll do whatever you ask us to do. Just come and help us. To God be the glory. God is amazing, isn't he? Wow. And that's the story of how Mavuno Berlin began. Some of you didn't know that story. But that's how we began. And today, there are missionaries from this congregation who've been sent. They're Germans, yes, but they're here. when you ask them, they'll tell you we're, we have an African heart. This is where we learned about how to lead church. And they're out there leading their churches, leading their church. And their vision is an impossible vision because their vision, the thing we've asked them to do is to reach the whole of Europe with culture-defining churches. This is how we do it. Because remember, it's not about where you come from. It's about who you represent. Ask your neighbor, who do you represent? Who do you represent? You know, I love Nigerian Christians. Don't you love Nigerians? Those guys have swag, don't they? I mean, <laughs> by the way, you can't be indifferent about Nigerians. Either you love them or you hate them. Uh, <laughs> you, you can't just be, they're not mediocre people. You either love them or you hate them. I love Nigerians. But you know, the amazing thing about Nigerian Christians, I believe they understand the power of the God they serve. The largest church in Europe is actually led by a Nigerian. 
His name is Sandy Adelaja, out in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, one, a country that was atheist until a few years ago. Church of 30,000 people. He leads this church. I mean, it's amazing because the picture I saw on the internet when I first heard about this church, you know how you often see this picture uh, back in the day of the, the evangelist from the West, uh, maybe a him and his wife, and then at the back, there's a whole lot of Africans behind them. So just inverse that in your mind. <laughs> When I saw that picture, I laughed. Because even for me, there are some things that are not supposed to happen. I was like, what? How did that happen? So guess what we did? We sent some of our pastors to investigate. Like this, this, this we have to see with our own eyes. So we sent Pastor Grace, who leads our Teens Connect. We sent Pastor Njoro, who leads Mavuno Kampala. So just go, see what's happening. They came back in awe about what God is doing. They said, listen, the mayor of that city of Kiev actually has been brought up in that church. Is a fearless influencer who's now a mayor, propped by this, the church to change the city. They said Miss Kiev, Miss Ukraine actually, is a member of that church, trained in that church, discipled, now has gone into the beauty industry to change it. They said the things that Mavuno is praying to do one day, they're doing now. Oh man, these Nigerians, you just have to love them. They're incredible. Did you know that the largest church in England is actually led by a Nigerian pastor? Matthew Ashimolo, did, did you know that? Did you know that the, one of the most amazing churches in the world is called RCCG? It's a Nigerian church. Have you heard of RCCG? Redeemed Christian Church of God. They have a pastor, Esther Basike, here. Uh, by the way, she's going to be one of, us, one of our speakers at the Fearless Summit. So you want to hear Pastor Esther. She's an amazing, amazing woman. But anyway, their story is incredible. They, they're just one of those stories. Unfortunately, Africans, we don't write as much. We should, because there are incredible things God is doing in this continent. But anyway, they, let me tell you this. When we heard about their church, we were so shocked that we also sent some pastors to investigate. At Mavuno, we don't take things at face value. We want to find out. So we sent Pastor Linda, and we sent a couple of our, of our pastors, and we said, go and find out. They came back with stories we could not believe. They went to their annual leadership summit, which is like our fearless summit. They told us, the first thing they told us is that there were 4 million people who attended. The population of Nairobi City came to their fearless summit. So now for us as Kenyans, we're trying to calculate how does 4 million people look like? So to, to put it in Kenyan language, they said, imagine the tent started here where Mavuno starts. Then you, you know how Kenyans say, you drive all the way to, to Nyayo Stadium. That's where the church ends. Okay, I can see you don't understand. I told you, these Nigerians know who they are. Ask your name, who do you represent? Because maybe your God is so small that these things are not even making sense in your mind. When this church began, it was begun in actually in 1965 by an illiterate man. Who then, in 19, uh, uh, later on in the 70s, God told him as he was about to die to pass it on to a younger man. And he said, you, it needs to be an educated man. This man walked into the church, wasn't a believer. He was a professor of mathematics, came to know Christ. In a couple of years, he became a pastor of that church. And a few years later, he was made the successor to this man. In 1981, he took over. Enoch Adeboye is his name. Incredible man of God. I've met this guy, one of the humblest guys you've ever seen. And he has led that church. Today they have 4,000 plus churches in Nigeria. Okay, you're not, I, I, know, I, thought you, I didn't say people. I said 4,000 churches. And... At his 70th birthday, which was recently, they celebrated a milestone because now they have at least a church in every country of the world. Somebody say, what? These Nigerians are crazy, oh. How do you trust God and do such things? Such exploits. Their property, their church property, where they are, is a thousand acres between Lagos and Ibadan. Some of you are saying, 32 acres. What do you do with that? Their property in North America is 500 acres because they have 600 churches in the whole of North America. This is in 30 years. Somebody's saying Nigerians have oil, we don't. You no longer have that excuse. <laughs> oh, Lord. You know, you know what their mission statement is? Their mission statement is to have an RCCG. No, here's, I have to read it. It's amazing. To have a member of RCCG in every family of every nation in the world. <laughs> Forget culture dividing churches. They say, Your family, yours, will have a member of our CCG on our watch. And, and the way they plan to do it is to plant a church within five minutes walking distance in, Niger or in every developing country. Five, mi five minutes walking distance 
And we, in every developed country of the world, the towns of the developed countries, to have a, ta- a church within 10 minutes driving distance. So not just one church in New York, but every 10 minutes of New York, they will have an RCCG church. That's their vision. Don't you love these Nigerians? Hey, listen, listen, listen. The one thing, I, I, get, I get jealous of these Nigerians, by the way. I have, to, I have to admit to a certain level of envy. Osai, are you here? Uh, I, she's, she's our Nigerian uh, our worship leader. I, I get envious of Nigeria sometimes when I think about them. But the one thing that consoles me whenever I think about them, there's something that consoles me. There's something that consoles me. God is not a Nigerian! He's not! If he can do it for them, he can do it for us! That's what I believe. This is what the Bible is saying. God is not a respecter of persons. If God can use Nigerians to do such crazy things, why not us? And I've prayed and told God, God, you're not a tribalist. You're not a racist. You're not a nationalist. If you can use them, you can use these people of Mavuno Church as well. You can use us as well. This is a God we serve. This is a God we serve. He can use us to change the world. By the way, this October, Pastor, Pastor Caro and I have been invited to a conference in New Zealand. So, so these people think we're going to preach. But actually what we're going to do is do a spy trip from Avuno, Wellington. Did you even know there's a city called Wellington? We're going to start a church there one of these days. So, so, so when, when we heard about this, when, when I told the guy who's invited me, by the way, you know when I come to a, church, to a city, I'm always thinking about how we're going to plant a church there. And he, he was so excited about it, he told several church pastors about our vision. And a couple of pastors were so shocked, they were so amazed, they decided they're coming for the Fearless Summit to see this church and see how we can partner to plant churches in Wellington. Are you understanding what God is doing? He's going ahead of us already. He's going ahead of us already. And some of you, the Lord will call to relocate from this church and to go to Wellington as professionals to help start that church. Look at your neighbor. Do they look like they like all blacks? Tell them this is the reason God gave you that love for rugby. That you can go and preach the gospel to young New Zealanders and bring them to Lord because there there, there are lost people out there and it's our turn because it doesn't, it's not about where you come from. It's who you represent. Ask your neighbor, who do you represent? Who do you represent? Now, you've probably noticed that I've mentioned Mavuno 3.0 in every one of the sermons I've preached about Heroes Wanted. And I want to just make a disclaimer at this point. My motivation has not been to coerce anybody to give has not been to coerce anybody who doesn't believe in this vision to believe in it that's not what my motivation has been my motivation has been to give Mavuno Church an understanding of the scope of what our vision is to help you understand what it is that God is calling us to you see for me when I look at what God is calling us to this piece of land it's actually a center for the reformation of nations that's what this is And I want you to understand that. So even for those of you who choose to say, I'll be counted in, I will give to this, you'll understand what you're doing. Nobody's trying to hustle you for anything. That's not what this is about. This is about saying, I will be part of what God is doing in my generation. And for those of you who choose to be part of this, I want you to understand what it is you're entering into. Because it's a huge thing. I want you to see yourself differently. You might have been looking at yourself as a small person with small issues. God doesn't have that plan for you. It's not about where you come from. It's about who you represent. And you represent the Lord Most High. This is who you are. And hence, this series. In 25 years, how old are you going to be? Calculate, calculate, calculate. Don't say loudly because you might shock the person next to you. Just calculate. 25 years. How old are you going to be? In 25 years, there will be an experience like this. People being transformed, lives being changed, families being brought together, fearless influencers being sent out into every sector of society. In every African capital city, it will be happening. And in addition to that, it will be happening across the world in all the gateway cities. What are the gateway cities? Come on, shout them out right now. New York is a big one. Paris, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Wellington, Sydney, Auckland. Vegas. Oh, that one. (laughs) Somebody's got a vision right there. (laughs) And what I'm saying is, by the time you get to that age that you thought about, this is what God is calling us to be doing. And you know what? Here's a picture I have. I have this picture. I I shared this in one of the vision nights. I have this picture. And it's a selfish picture, so the Lord forgive me if it's not a good picture. But I've, I've been dreaming this dream. 
I see myself on a cruise ship. 25 years from now. Celebrating my 65th birthday. Well, give or take. Uh, and, and I see myself in a huge cruise ship with a bunch of Mavunites, people who are in this congregation right now. And it's, 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 it's a celebration. We'll be celebrating what God has done. It'll be a celebration of God's blessing upon our lives. It'll be a celebration of God's blessing upon this church. We'll be celebrating because there'll be people from every nation represented around us. And we'll be giving thanks to God because of how he's used us to change the world in our generation. That's the picture that I have. I've just shared with you my secret fantasy. Maybe some of you can join me in having that dream. Amen. 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 And when you're on that cruise ship with me, you remind me, Pastor, you remember you said this one day. God answered our prayer. It's not about where we came from. It's about who we represented. This is what this vision is about. I want to end with a story. Ending my series with a story. In 1914, a historic British explorer, his name was Sir Ernest Shackleton, and he was planning an impossible mission. He wanted to be the first person to go across the South Pole. Nobody had ever accomplished such a feat. Frozen waste. Not a single, in fact, most, I think they have just a few days of sun every year. Frozen dark. Complete sub-zero temperatures. Four, five, I think it was 2,000 mile journey. And he was looking for people who would go with him on that journey. So he put an advertisement, a recruitment advertisement in the newspaper. This was not the kind of recruitment that you would read on the Friday Standard. It was a completely different. It's not one of the ones your corporate would put out. Because this is what it said. Men wanted for a hazardous journey. Small wages. Bitter cold. Long hours of complete darkness. Constant danger. Safe return doubtful. <laughs> but honor and recognition in the event of success. Done. You're probably thinking, who in their right mind would answer to an advertisement like that? Well, the story goes that over 5,000 people applied for that job. And he had the hard chance of whittling down to 28 people. And those 28 people rode their way into history on a ship called the Endurance. They didn't manage to cross the whole South Pole, but they had such heroic exploits that books have been written about them movies have been made about them all their names are engraved in history i believe that today god is looking to recruit some heroes first corinthians or second sorry, sorry second chronicles chapter 16 verse 9 this is what it says it says the eyes of the lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him God's recruiting agency, heaven recruiting agency, is looking for heroes today. Heroes for this mission to change the world. And if God was to put out a classified, he would, it would read this way. Heroes wanted for hazardous, impossible mission of taking a city, changing a continent, and winning the world. Challenges galore. High risk of misunderstanding and criticism by others. Only God's presence and power guaranteed. Who will sign up for this mission? Mavuno, Mavuno Church, your mission, should you accept it, is nothing less than the complete change of the world in which we live. You're not the difficult mission force. You are the impossible mission force. But understand this, that you serve the God of the impossible. This is who God is calling us to be. And I believe that the Lord is asking today, who will stand up and be counted? Who will say that my greatest ambition is to accomplish the purpose of God in my generation? Who will stop living the life they can accomplish by their own strength and begin to trust God for the kind of life that can only be accomplished by heaven's strength? Who will say, I will not settle for a comfortable Christian life, but I will live for the things that give eternal value discover my purpose and be one of those agents that God uses to change my city, to take my continent and to win my world. Who will be counted? Remember, it's not about where you come from. Oh, come on, Mavuno. It's not about where you come from. It's who you represent. Shake your neighbor and ask them, who do you represent? Who do you represent? 
I want to pray for us as I conclude this series. And as I come to the end, I just want to say this. It's, I hope you've heard my heart. God has given us a vision that is too big for one pastor. I, I tremble when I think about this vision God has given us. But I believe that he has raised many here who will be partakers of this vision. And together we will change this world. We'll change our offices. We'll change our families. We'll change our nations. We'll change this world. But I believe that there's some here, I want to just pray real quick. There's some here who have not given their lives to Jesus at all. Or maybe you once walked with him and you, 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 you know right now you're not walking with him. Listen, your, your heart is beating because you resonate with this vision. You want to be one of those who change the world. But remember what Reverend Kwame said earlier. God is not after your money. He wants your heart. If he has your heart, he can give you the purpose he made you for. You can't do this thing on your own strength, on your own agenda. It's only as you surrender to his agenda that he comes in and he reveals the hero that he created you to be. And there are some of you who are like, now I understand, Pastor M. I finally get it. Why my life needs to belong to him. I've been running for different reasons. But now I'm ready for an encounter with this God. And if you're here, I'm just going to pray for you real quick. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand wherever you are. Don't worry about who's with you or who's beside you. This is not about them. This is about your eternal destiny and your ability to be the hero that God has called you to be. Come on, just raise it wherever you are. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you, my brother, right at the back. To God be the glory for you. Thank you, my sister, as well. I see your hand. To God be the glory for you as well. Oh, come on, just raise it up strong and proud. And we're going to pray for you. I see two brothers on this side. I see a sister as well. I see another sister as well. Oh, my goodness. To God be the glory. Anybody else? Come on, just raise it up wherever you are. Anybody else? Just raise it up high proud. I see a brother at the back as well. To God be the glory for you. I see other people outside as well. Come on, just raise it if you're outside. I see another brother at the tent outside. To God be the glory for you, my brother. Woo! Woo! Amen. 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 Anybody else? There's a sister here as well. There's another sister at the front here. Oh God, you're doing great things in the church. There's a brother at the front here as well. Woo! Lord, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. To God be the glory. You know what? Just keep your hand up. There's somebody who's going to come and give you a piece of paper. Just keep it up right now. It's going to be just a place where you can indicate your name and we can pray for you after the service. So just put your hand up. To God be the glory. Come on, let's appreciate every single one whose hand has been up. Hey, don't be left behind. If you haven't been seen, just put your hand up so we can appreciate you. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Oh, come on. Somebody just give glory to God again. <laughs> We want to pray for you, everyone who's made that commitment, everyone who's prayed that prayer. By the way, if you don't receive that piece of paper, make sure you get one. But I want to just pray for you as we conclude. I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand one more time as I pray, as I lead you in this prayer. Those of you who raised your hand as I lead you in this prayer. This is not a magic prayer, but this is a prayer where you're coming before your father and you're saying, Lord, I surrender to you. Make me your son, daughter, the hero you created me to be. So as you raise your hand, say these words after me. And I'm going to ask the rest of the congregation those who are part of this family, to just pray with them. Dear Jesus, I come to you to give you my life. From this day forward, I surrender to you. Come into my life. Make me your son and or daughter. I want to be the hero that you created me to be, to be a world changer. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Come on, Mavuno. Let's appreciate everyone who's prayed that prayer. Woo! <laughs> Amen. Can we all say to them, welcome to the family? Welcome to the family. Well, if you're sitting next to one of them, just give them a high five. Them, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. If you've given us that slip of paper, what we're going to do is we're going to use that to just send you some literature, give you a call during the week and encourage you. So make sure you at least you sign up. If you didn't put up your hand for any reason, ask one of our ushers for one of those slips of paper. We'd love to pray for you. Now here's the last prayer I want to pray. There's some of you, there are a lot of visitors here. I recognize the people from other churches. We love you. We are so grateful you're worshiping with us. Other people who are just checking us out, we thank God for every single one of you. Mavuno is for people like you. But listen, I want to pray now for those who are part of this church who are saying, 
I've understood the vision of Mavuno Church. I understand why we exist as a church. And you know what? I want to be part of this vision. I want to identify with this vision. I want to give to this vision. I want to be part of this vision. And I'm committing myself to stand and be one of those who is counted. And I'm standing right now because I am one of them. Who will stand up and join me right now and I'll pray for you. Come on, stand wherever you are. If you're a member of this church, you're saying, I believe in this vision. Oh, I'm not here for anything else. I'm here because I believe in what God is calling us to be and whose God is calling us to change. And I'm part of this. Oh, come on, appreciate yourselves, Mavunites, and your fellow Mavunites as you stand. To God be the glory for you. I want to pray for you, Mavunites. Father, I thank you for these who are standing right now. Lord, we thank you for our visitors. We thank you for those who are visiting us. But right now, I want to pray a family prayer. I thank you for these who are standing up who are saying, this is my family, this is my home, this is my church, this is my vision. I am part of what God has called us to be. And Lord Jesus, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you that, Lord, when we started this vision seven years ago, we had no idea that you're going to raise up an army that would be part of us, and together we would do great things. Lord, we don't stand because we are much. We have issues. We have issues in our marriages. We have issues in our families. Many of us have issues. We're not where we must be. But we thank you that we're not where we used to be. And we thank you that daily you're transforming us and making us more into the image of Jesus. I speak your blessing over these, your people. I pray that, Lord, you'd continue to let this word burn in their hearts. This self-definition we've learned this month. That, Lord Jesus, you'd remind them every day that they're heroes to change this world. I speak that, Lord change would begin to emanate from them. That their offices would see a difference because of who they are. Their families would see a difference because of who they are. And I pray that people would begin to look at them as people of distinction. And I pray that, Lord, indeed, none of them would fall off from this vision. None of them would fall off from the thing you've called us to. Every one of them would accomplish the purpose of God for their generation. I speak blessing over you, Mafuno. I speak blessing. Come on, stand up, the rest of us, our visitors, if you just join us right now. We want to conclude in a, in a moment where we say our family creed. And I mean, we're inviting you to join us in this creed because it's a Christian creed for every Christian. And I'm going to just say it and you can, you can say it after me because I don't think our screen uh, is behaving this weekend. Are you ready, Mavuno? All right, let's go together. I am a fearless influencer. My past is forgiven. My future is secure. My present is not for me. But for the one who set me free. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. No more prayerless living. Cheap giving. Selfish dreaming. I am part of the change. I will not hesitate to serve. I will gladly pay the cost. Contagiously spreading his love. Playing my role on the dream team. Until all Africa is changed. Every sector of society. I align myself to God's purpose. I will be who he calls me to be. I agree to be shaped and molded through his word and through his family until my will and his fully agree and I become the influencer that I was created to be. Together now I'm a fearless influencer. I am a fearless influencer. To God be the glory. Woo! Give glory to God. You know what? I don't need to bless you because you've already blessed yourself. I'm just going to dismiss you. But before I do, if you pray that prayer, please make sure you bring that slip of paper to our tent, to our connect tent outside, and somebody will receive them from you. God bless you. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell them you're a hero.